want to thank you all so very much for being here today. My name is Sherry Beasley, and I'm the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of North Carolina. And as you can see, I am joined by leaders from all over the state of North Carolina. We're especially honored to have Governor Roy Cooper to be with us here today. We have leaders from our schools, from law enforcement, and from juvenile justice. And also thankful that we have members of the General Assembly here as well today. Everyone here today is deeply invested in making sure that our young people are successful across the state of North Carolina. The truth is that school discipline has changed dramatically over the last 20 years. And the thing we want to do is to make sure that arrest is used in only the most severe offenses. Last year, more than 11,000 children were referred to the juvenile justice system from the schools and only a fraction of those offenses were very serious ones. The one thing we know is that when we see referrals from the schools to juvenile justice is that these young people are less likely to graduate from high school, more likely to repeat a grade in school, and more likely to later on be charged as an adult for more serious offenses. Our courts must focus on making sure that our young people are successful. I want to thank the General Assembly for passing Raise the Age. This has really given the courts an opportunity to push forward the school justice partnerships and to create a toolkit so that communities have a guide to make sure that our young people are successful, that they can keep their graduation rates up, and that young people stay in the classrooms and not our courtrooms. School justice partnerships allow those closest to students every day to really understand why young people come to the juvenile justice system in the first place why it is they're behaving badly. And it's important to really think about whether or not these young people are hungry, whether or not they are suffering from maltreatment, whether or not they have a caregiver in their family who is ill or suffering from addiction. And these are problems that are better addressed by the social services system rather than our courts. Through school justice partnerships, teachers and principals and SROs agree to think differently about discipline to redirect behavior so that our young people can be successful, so they can see themselves as successful and imagine that they can have very different kinds of outcomes for their lives. The toolkit that we are releasing today will provide school systems across the state of North Carolina with a step-by-step -step guide for creating their own school justice partnerships that can be tailored directly for their judicial districts. Chief District Court judges will convene, convene community leaders across the state, local stakeholders, so they can come up with their own ways of individualizing these toolkits so that they best fit those communities. Counties that have already implemented the school justice partnerships have seen a more than a 50% decrease in referrals, dramatic improvements in their graduation rates, and all while improving school safety. We're very proud to say that 35 counties have signed on to school justice partnerships and we have even more counties and districts having those conversations about joining us today. School justice partnerships are one of the most important investments in the success of young people that we can make. We're very excited about bringing together our partners in education, in juvenile justice, and law enforcement to keep our kids in school where they can build better futures for themselves and for their communities. I am pleased and honored to introduce to you now Governor Roy Cooper. Thank you for your leadership on this issue, Madam Chief Justice Beasley. I want to thank uh, Sheriff Rogers and his team for being here, my Secretary of the Department of Public Safety, Eric Hooks, and his team who've been working so hard on this. We know that young people who stay in school and do well are more likely to be successful and less likely to commit crime. We also know that schools often struggle with behavior problems that too often result in suspension or expulsion and the child being referred to the juvenile court system. In fact, if as Chief Justice Beasley mentioned, about 40% of juvenile justice complaints are initiated at our schools. And we know that suspension and expulsion 
increase the problems that a student repeats a grade, drops out, or gets in trouble with the law. There's a better way. School justice partnerships help schools, law enforcement, communities, and the court system work together to more effectively and efficiently help students who are spending time in juvenile court for minor offenses. Now, in our schools, even minor offenses can cause class disruption, can frustrate teachers, and keep other students from learning. That's a problem that has to be addressed. And we need to help them deal with that. At the same time, we know that too many suspensions and expulsions and court appearances have a negative effect on children and on school safety. That's why that this toolkit in conjunction with these partnerships can be effective in schools and communities across North Carolina to help them find that better answer to this. We want more successful students. We want safer schools. We want a less burdened court system. All of us working together can help achieve that goal. Here's an example of one partnership. In New Hanover County, we've gotten a report from the superintendent where their school justice partnership is working that they have seen a 67% reductions in referral of children to juvenile courts. At the same time, their statistics show that their schools are safer, their graduating ra graduation rates are rising, and the school resource officers who are often key in this, and I'm very grateful for those school resource officers across our state who not only work to keep schools safe, but also work with students to help them improve. In New Hanover County, school resource officers are spending more time on the school safety issues and less time filing these juvenile petitions and sitting in the courtroom regarding these students. This makes a lot of sense. And when we find something that works, we need to go with it. Collaboration works. When we're all working toward the same goal, getting our educators, our law enforcement officers, our communities, the court system, all of these can work together to find solutions to make our schools safer and our children succeed. When you find something that works, let's make sure that it gets across the state. And that's what Chief Justice Beasley, under her leadership, is doing with distributing these toolkits. I endorse it. We want this, these justice, school justice partnerships to be working all over North Carolina so that we can have safer and more successful schools. And now I want to recognize uh, District Court uh, Judge Elizabeth Trosh from Mecklenburg County. Judge Trosh. Good morning. Um, I am a district court judge in Mecklenburg County, which is one of the largest districts in North Carolina. It includes the city of Charlotte. And in 2012, um, I traveled to New York for a national summit with our now director of the AOC, Mr. Wooten, and Judge Corpening from New Hanover County, and learned about pioneering work in which courts bring together law enforcement, prosecutors, juvenile justice, and the schools to collaborate around solutions that can keep kids in school and out of court. Um, in North Carolina, since 1996, the number of school resource officers has increased 250%, and there's been a commensurate increase in school-based arrests over that same period. What we started to realize uh, is that most of those school-based offenses involve minor misconduct that doesn't really compromise school safety, and that 
there are strategies that we could implement if we work together to pull to to, uh, to um, collectively deploy resources uh, to support kids uh, who are having minor misconduct. We also learned that the very act of referring a child to court for minor misconduct increases risks of truancy, academic failure, and future justice system involvement. So this meant that not only are kids worse off when referred to court for minor offenses, but it also meant that our courts could not focus its resources on the kids who really do commit serious offenses and cause harm and have complex needs. So in 2013, uh, we pulled together six police departments, our prosecutor's office, and uh, the school district with juvenile justice to create school-based diversion for minor offenses committed by students at school. As we were work do, engaging in this work, we realized that students had different opportunities and different responses depending on the building they were in, the police department that had jurisdiction over uh, the school and uh, offenses committed in the school, and that largely children were having very different experiences across our district. By bringing everyone together through this collaborative effort, we've been able to ensure that all students have access to the kinds of responses that not only hold them accountable, but address their needs so that they can remain in school and out of court. We've, our police departments have had, since our uh, partnership formed in 2013, 30,000 positive contacts between youth and law enforcement. We've diverted uh, between six and 700 students a year. And what's really remarkable about the outcomes that we have seen is that the students who are diverted ha are, are far less likely to commit another offense than those who are referred to court they have a recidivism rate that's about one-fourth of the uh, general recidivism rate for referrals to court. There have been some other outcomes that we've seen that aren't necessarily captured in the data. We've seen school resource officers who have really shifted their thinking about what it means to be a school resource officer in a school building who are engaging with children, problem solving with children, forming relationships with children that really do contribute to a trusting relationship which facilitates a safer learning environment for all students. In other jurisdictions that pioneered this work and frankly from whom we have learned a great deal in uh, pioneering it here in North Carolina and building the toolkit, school justice partnerships not only make schools safer and improve school climate, graduation rates, and so on and so forth, but in uh, Georgia and jurisdictions where these uh, partnerships started, uh, community-wide juvenile crime went down by over 50%. So I'm very pleased and so excited that the General Assembly has endorsed this practice as a practice for the state and that the AOC has invested the resources that it has to empower districts all across North Carolina to keep kids in school and out of court. Um, and now I would like to introduce Dr. Sharon Contreras, who is the superintendent of Guilford County Schools. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today to officially kick off a partnership designed to improve our communities and ultimately the life outcomes of our students by keeping children in class and out of the court system. First, I want to thank the Eastern Guilford High School community and Principal Lance Sockwell for hosting us this afternoon. Is Principal Sockwell behind? Is he here? Well, thank you so much, Lance, for hosting us. I also want to welcome our distinguished guests, including Governor Roy Cooper and Chief Justice Sherry Beasley. Yesterday, I returned from a leadership retreat with the 25 members of my leadership council. The retreat, sponsored through a generous donation, allowed us to plan in Montgomery, Alabama for the upcoming school year. Montgomery is the home of the civil rights movement. We walked in the steps of Rosa Parks, the Freedom Riders, and of course, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We visited the Legacy Museum, and we visited the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. 
we held our leadership retreat there to center and ground ourselves in the equity work that must be done in Guilford County Schools to ensure improved outcomes for our students and the flourishing of our beloved community, Guilford County. The Georgetown Law Center recently released a report that people of all races see children of color as less innocent, more adult-like, and more responsible for their actions than their peers. Consequently, normal childhood behavior like disobedience, tantrums, and backtalk is seen as a criminal threat when black and brown kids do it. The Law Center concluded that this misperception causes black and brown children to be pushed out and underprotected. The safety and well-being of our students has been and is now and always will be a top priority for this school district. And in the past years, Guilford County Schools has taken steps to increase safety and to improve the overall culture and learning environment of our schools. Last year, we kicked off three programs aimed at not only keeping kids in class, but making schools a more positive place where they feel supported and nurtured. We piloted a restorative justice initiative in select high schools and middle schools to find more positive ways to address behavioral issues. This brings me to why we are here today. The Social Justice Partnership is a new effort to deal with minor nonviolent misbehaviors in school while keeping our scholars in class. I was fortunate while serving as Chief Academic Officer to help begin the first school justice partnership in the country in Clayton County under the leadership of Judge Steve Teske and Dr. Barbara Pulliam, the superintendent. The reason for this effort is simple. Current exclusionary practices such as suspension, expulsion, and school-based court referrals have the opposite of the desired impact. Exclusionary practices lead to underachievement, dropping out, poor health outcomes, increased delinquency, and hurtling our children toward prison, all which bode poorly on our community and residents. Faced with poverty, family instability, lack of stable housing, disproportionate substance abuse and violence in their communities, hunger, and other adverse childhood experiences that lead to trauma and mental health issues, we too often fail to ask ourselves and our children why they misbehave. Even worse, we fail to provide much needed access to counselors, psychologists, school nurses, psychiatrists, and other support staff to deal with the high stress environments in which too many of our children exist. Our schools and communities across the country have become mental health deserts. We can't serve our students or our community if children are not in school. By continuing to work alongside Guilford County's phenomenal local law enforcement leadership like Chief Wayne Scott of Greensboro, Chief Kenneth Schultz of High Point, and Sheriff Danny Rogers in the county, by working with the Guilford County Juvenile Justice System, as well as local and state lawmakers, we can begin to make real change. I believe we all desire to support our children and our community. I also believe that we are capable of doing better when we know better. Brian Stevenson says every one of us is in need of more mercy, more redemption, and more justice. We also need to give more mercy, more redemption, and a great deal more justice. A better community is why I look forward to this collaborative effort that will transform learning and life outcomes for all of our children. Thank you, and I'd like to introduce Brunswick County Sheriff John W. Ingram. Good morning. I'm John Ingram, Sheriff of Brunswick County and President of North Carolina Sheriff's Association. I'd like to start by saying thank you to Chief Justice Beasley and Governor Cooper for allowing me to be here and speak on behalf of the Sheriff's Association. The North Carolina Sheriff's Association is extremely proud to be a part of any project that aims at redirecting the lives of at-risk youth. From a local perspective in Brunswick, since implementing the program in 2017, we've experienced a dramatic increase in the number of juvenile complaints being referred 
from our schools to the judicial system. In fact, the decrease was nearly 45% in the first year alone. Community-based diversion programs such as teen court give first-time offenders a second chance to get things right and learn from their mistakes without becoming part of the revolving cycle of the criminal justice system. Affording our school resource officers with the discretion to work with the various stakeholders to divert students involved in situations into community-based programs ensures they are held accountable without a juvenile court record. At the end of the day, our goal is public safety and keeping our schools safe. The School Justice Partnership Project affords law enforcement the ability to accomplish this with, that, with alternative options that redirect the lives of young people ensuring accountability without a lasting negative impact. Thank you again to all of the various stakeholders who have played a valuable part in making this project a reality. We hope to see these efforts replicated across the state. Thank you. Well, I hope you can see why we are so excited about school justice partnerships across the state of North Carolina. It is truly exciting that we have folks who are standing here with us and, and people across the state who are partnering and really excited about really changing lives for young people. Um, I think um, the governor and uh, Judge Trosh said it very well when they talked about the importance of SROs being, yes, disciplinarians, um, and yes, young people, the folks that young people look up to, but they've become mentors. And I think that's been exceptionally excited as a part of this whole process. Um, we are certainly available to take questions if you have any. Chief Justice, could you please explain this program? We've heard why it's the intended goal. We understand that it had some success in other places. I don't know that I or many other people understand in a basic form. How does it work? Judge Charles, would you like to answer this question? Sure. Um, so uh, as you heard, the, the, the AOC is launching um, a toolkit, and the toolkit is intended to provide some framework for local jurisdictions to design this for their own needs. But generally speaking, the way that this works is that together within a local jurisdiction, we kind of look at what are the kinds of things that are getting referred to court from schools? Are there some things that we can sort of target as the types of things that don't necessitate a referral. So for example, you might identify a handful of minor offenses that by their very nature don't threaten public or school safety and say those are eligible for some kind of non-law enforcement response. And so uh, generally um, how that all, you know, what those responses are will differ from one jurisdiction to another. But for example, in Mecklenburg County, if you have a young person who, you know, is caught with alcohol at school, the, rather than issue a juvenile arrest and refer that child to juvenile justice and juvenile court, the school resource officer would refer them to our diversion coordinators who would then um, link that child with a drug education program or a substance abuse assessment if that was warranted, for example. Um, for uh, school fights and, uh, and my assaults that don't involve serious injury, the school resource officer, rather than doing an arrest, might engage the parents and the, and the students in a referral to a restorative justice program where they could mediate the conflict and resolve that conflict in a way that allows them to return to the building and, and really have meaningful resolution and get back to the business at school. Um, so that's that's sort of a framework of, of what it, of what it would look like, and and I think that what's uh, unique about this approach is that we're really bringing everybody together to build um, consensus around what the policies and the procedures will be uh, to make sure that. There's, you know, that the, the policies of the district attorney's office, juvenile justice, and each of the law enforcement agencies are complementary to one another um, to achieve those goals. I just want to be clear. The SRO makes the final referral decision. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, are SROs going through any special training so they'll be capable? I, it, it is our experience that that is a critical part of a school justice partnership. In our jurisdiction, we have six different law enforcement agencies that might you know, respond to a school-based offense or have SROs in the building. And so actually under the leadership of Lieutenant Ratliff, who's here today, we've developed an interagency uh, SRO curriculum 
uh, that SROs are required to participate in every year before the school year starts. And they learn about the diversion program. They learn about developmental specific practices for engaging with students. They complete mental health first aid. And they also receive implicit bias training uh, because one of the things that we have seen nationally and certainly in our data is that all things being equal, children of color are two and a half times more likely to be suspended or referred to court than their white peers for the same conduct. So that the training is a really important component of a school justice partnership to ensure that those SROs really are equipped with the tools that they need in order to, to execute those. Is there someone here who manages SROs could answer the question whether or not this puts an awful lot of pressure on an SRO to make the right call? I, I would be glad to have um, somebody from the sheriff. Would you like to sh talk about it, Sheriff? But the other thing I think it's really important that we all keep in mind is that all of this, whether we're talking about policies and procedures, all grounded in forming relationships so that young people have the ability to trust. I mean, most of these folks are having issues within their families, within their communities, and so often what we see manifested as uh, misbehavior or what may be perceived as criminal behavior really is a manifestation of not being able to really articulate what's going on in their homes. And so the basis upon why these partnerships are so successful is that we have key folks who are with these young people every single day asking the question, why? that the presumption is not that these are just bad kids, but when, when, when the SRO asks, why did you hit somebody, or why, why did you, you know, why did you do whatever it is, it makes a difference, because these young people often don't have people asking, why? They don't have people in their lives often, or these folks who are in their lives need support. And so it's really important, I mean, I, you know, when we have educators and SROs who see our young people, often more hours of a day that sometimes, you know, parents do, and that's that applies to all of us. It's important that these folks are invested in a different kind of way. So I think just asking the question why, caring about what that answer is, and determining how those resources can then be responsive to those whys are, I think, part of really the foundation of why this part, these partnerships are so successful. And I, and I would just add very quickly that one of the things that we learned is that a lot of uh, our, our, how we got a lot of the police departments to the table was responding to that question, well, what else do I do? Because we had SROs at the table saying, well, I don't want to always do an arrest or a referral to court, but I also don't want to do nothing. I need that something else. And that's what school justice partnerships allow us to do, is really equip and empower school resource officers with that something else that is, um, that is responsive that, and that holds young people accountable. But I'm sure that there are law like enforcement folks SROs? who can. The question about SRs, would you like to? The sheriff. Yeah. Kenneth Schultz, High Point Police Department. And I think what we're seeing here is a lot of it really does hinge on the SROs or school resource officers. Across the country, we've seen a wide variety of SROs. In our agency specifically, it's a coveted job. They're very competitive. When an opening comes up, it's people that specifically care about the kids, want to get out there and be involved. So uh, if you've got a school system that doesn't have that, you're going to have problems to begin with as well. The other thing I'll say is that resources are a critical part of us being able to be successful out here. 911 has become a catch-all for everything and if a program like this is able to bring resources that can help look at the underlying problems and take some of this off of law enforcement specifically it's going to be a good thing so working in partnership we're going to be a lot more successful in finding the things that these kids need finding the resources to manage them in the situations and to keep our schools safe good morning Training and the tools that this organization has brought together, I'm very grateful that it has been done. We sent our uh, SROs to training this year uh, to make sure that diversity, to understand different cultures, different communities, different mindsets of our youth that we deal with on a daily basis are well taken in. A lot of times if you have not been in the environment, that you expose that you exposed to in a, as a, a working environment, you can't understand why someone may act out the way they do. 
So our goal, and I truly look forward for our SROs to do very well this year, as, as they have, has always done, is to really get a chance to ask the question, why? Ask the question, why? Because our youth are really struggling, and we, don't, we need to make sure that we can continue to build for the future without making sure that we're, by making sure that we're not arresting everybody or referring them to the court system just because they got a push and match or they call someone a name. So, but we just want to make sure that you understand we are teaching and educating, and the tools uh, that have been put in place, I think that we are doing very well with it, and we're doing even better with the more tools that's been given to us. Thank you. Hello, I would just like to echo some of the comments made by the sheriff and the chief as well. I believe that the SROs that we have, especially in Guilford County, are extremely dedicated professionals and all of our agencies try to educate them and give them training so they can perform at the highest level. And any additional resources that this program can make available so that we continue our partnerships with the court system, our partnerships with the school system and with each other so that our students can be successful and safe in our schools is certainly our highest priority. And at the Greensboro Police Department and countywide, I believe we look forward to it. We certainly appreciate each of you being here today. We're so thankful for our partners who are here today, but also represent those who are across the state of North Carolina. And we look forward to being able to tell you about even more success stories going forward. Thank you so much.